The British had ceded the Northwest Territory to America as part of the Treaty of Paris. This territory included lands that would one day be the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and a portion of Minnesota, and was already populated by various Indian tribes who had been British allies in the war. Angry over American settlers encroaching on their lands, the tribes reformed the Western Confederacy. Indian raids were answered by settler attacks, each growing more vicious, and neither side recognizing the concept of non-combatants. In 1790 and 1791, small, combined forces of regular American troops and state militias moved against the Western Confederacy and suffered brutal losses. Theodore Roosevelt later wrote about the Army's struggles with the Native American tribes. He described the conditions of the troops sent with General Arthur St. Clair against the Northwest tribes in November 1791. The troops were of wretched stuff. There were two small regiments of regular infantry, the rest of the army being composed of six months levies and a militia ordered out for this particular campaign. The pay was contemptible. Each private was given $3 a month from which 90 cents was deducted. Men of good bodily powers and in the prime of life, and especially men able to do the rough work of frontier farmers, could not be hired to fight Indians in unknown forests for $2 a month. Most of the recruits were from the streets and prisons of the seaboard cities. They were hurried into a campaign against peculiarly formidable foes before they had acquired the rudiments of a soldier's training. Under such conditions, it did not need keen vision to foretell disaster. Of the 1,400 men fighting under St. Clair, almost half were killed and hundreds more were wounded. It was a devastating defeat. Congress was moved to action. The first Militia Act authorized the president to call out the state militias whenever the United States shall be invaded or be in imminent danger of invasion from any foreign nation or Indian tribe. But at the same time, no officer, non-commissioned officer, or private of the militia shall be compelled to serve more than three months in any one year. The Second Militia Act stated that each and every free, able-bodied white male citizen of the respective states, resident therein, who is or shall be of the age of 18 years and under the age of 45 years, shall respectively be enrolled in the militia by the captain or commanding officer of the company. And it shall at all times hereafter be the duty of every such captain or commanding officer of a company to enroll every such citizen. That within one year after the passing of this act, the militia of the respective states shall be arranged into divisions, brigades, regiments, battalions, and companies, as the legislature of each state shall direct. The act further detailed the specific arms that each and every free, able-bodied white male citizen must acquire and maintain once enrolled. Compliance with the act was left up to the states, and as could be expected, the quality of training and equipment for the militias varied greatly. Discipline was generally poor, and the militias did not do well when asked to perform the complex maneuvers common to professional armies of the day. But they could fight well as irregulars, and they provided a large base from which volunteers could be drawn in support of the regular army. They also maintained the notion of the citizen soldier and laid the groundwork for what would one day be the U.S. National Guard. Also in 1792, on Secretary of War Henry Knox's recommendation, Congress authorized the creation of what Knox called a legion. The Legion of the United States was composed of four sub-legions, each with its own infantry, artillery, cavalry, and riflemen. The first and second sub-legion were created from the remnants of the 1st and 2nd Regiments of the Continental Army, and the 3rd and 4th sub-legions were new recruits. 
A few years later, these sublegions became the first, second, third, and fourth regiments of the U.S. Army. Soon after its creation, the Legion of the United States, led by Major General Anthony Wayne, began retaking ground lost to the Western Confederacy. They trained hard, and in 1795, they defeated the Indian forces at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, leading to a treaty between the two nations. For the next century and more, America's armies would follow three main types. At the core was the standing professional army. This would remain relatively small for most of the nation's history, and its primary duties would be manning permanent forts across the country, fighting Indians, and producing engineering and other construction works. Additionally, the states maintained their militias, though these varied greatly in terms of training, discipline, and equipment. The militia elected their own officers, which did not always result in the most competent men being given command. When facing the threat of invasion or insurrection, the president could call the militia into federal service. However, they could only be compelled to serve the federal government for up to three months. Although the militias could and did fight well at times, more often than not, the regular army did not find them reliable under fire. The third category of army troops was the volunteer army. These were troops raised only during time of war who served one to three years in volunteer regiments. Again and again, in times of war, the volunteer regiments would augment the ranks of the regular army. And every time, when the war was over, the citizen soldiers would return to their shops and fields while the regular army manned the forts. These groups were not exactly respectful of each other. They were useless, 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 expensive, wasteful, good for nothing, said one regular army officer during the Mexican War, speaking of the volunteers. Meanwhile, a volunteer was said to refer to soldiers in the regular army who followed orders without argument as moving musket-holding machines. But despite their animosity, when necessary, they would stand shoulder to shoulder to face a common foe. Congress took further actions to improve the quality of the army, including the creation of a national armory during the Revolutionary War, American soldiers had used flintlock muskets from a variety of French, British, and colonial sources. After the war, the American army needed its own standard-issue musket. In 1776, an arsenal had been established in Springfield, Massachusetts. In 1794, it became the first national armory. In 1795, the Springfield Armory produced the first truly American musket. The 1795 U.S. Army musket was modeled on the French Charleville musket, which had been popular among American soldiers and militia. In 1799, construction began on the second National Armory at Harper's Ferry in the western part of Virginia that would eventually split off to become West Virginia. By 1810, over 10,000 muskets rifles and pistols were produced there each year. If you're eager to see more of our historical documentaries, please like, share, and subscribe.